Welcome to What Are You Sporting About podcast, a podcast about business, employment, sports, and entertainment to help educate, support, and guide you to your next level. Here's your host, attorney Savania DeBarros. We have another um, pro on the call, Porsche Grant, and she is, she's amazing, (laughs) but she has a passion for educating players on transitioning. And we talked a lot about um, how athletes get to a place where they're not setting the right um, strategic plans or putting finances in place and setting budgets or monitoring their their accounts, but also not really knowing what they want to do post sports. And so one of her passions is to help these athletes transition. Good morning, Porsche. How are you? Great morning, everyone. I'm fine, Savania. Thank you for having me. I really oh, appreciate absolutely. it. Absolutely. So, Porsche, tell us a little bit about yourself and what led you to helping athletes. Okay. Um, I am from uh, Washington, D.C. I played at the University of South Florida, Uh, got into sports late, stayed in sports a long time, had some ups and downs, rounds and rounds, figured out what works for me. And I, similar to what you said, my purpose, I found my purpose to be to help people figure out what works for them from a professional standpoint. Love it. Now, you're a woman, a former professional athlete, and uh, you know, as a woman, there are certain challenges that we face that our counterparts don't necessarily encounter. So talk to us a little bit about what particular challenges you face um, as a professional athlete, just as a woman, abroad, what have you. Tell us about your challenges. And I do apologize for any background noise. I am in a hotel. It's okay. Um, But uh, one thing, I I did play overseas, so unfortunately I never got an opportunity to play in the WNBA or I didn't take the opportunity when I had it. Um, But one thing that was hard was being a mom uh, and a professional athlete at the same time and being away from my kid. Uh, Anyone with a young child between the ages of zero to six months, zero to two years old, you know, being away from your children is a uh, burden within itself. Uh, Just being away from family from the young age of 12 to 13, all the way up until the age of 22, 23 years old, you know, really not being home for holidays, not being able to see nieces and nephews be born, you know, when mom is sick, not being able to go visit the hospital. We, most people take things like this for granted. Mm -hmm. And I know uh, unique to this experience, Otis and Lorente, you too probably have experienced this, but that's something that's very hard because you can't get that time back, you right. know? Um, so when you do fly into town for 24 hours or 48 hours and you try to squeeze everyone in and people yeah. just say, oh, you never get to see me when you're home or you never come. It's like, Listen, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. Right. Right. <laughs> um, right. Uh, another challenge while playing pro, um, since I was playing overseas, uh, was adjusting to the game. The rules are different there. Uh, everyone doesn't know you, right? Some countries, they love Americans. Some countries, they don't. Right. Just, sometimes you're David. <laughs> Other times right. you're the love, right? Right. And uh, one thing, uh, I thought I was maybe going to hear this from uh, Lorente or Otis. Uh, one of the obstacles I had was the agent that I selected first when I went pro. I inherited an agent from one of my teammates who did very well. She played at the University of Virginia. She also uh, was drafted into the WNBA, was the second draft pick uh, in 2010. And, you know, we played AAU together. And her agent was a big-time agent. He did a bunch of WNBA players, this, that, and the third. And although I was good, um, he really didn't care about me. I wasn't a big fish. So being a small fish, just like with anything else, if I'm not bringing you $500,000 contracts or $250,000 contracts, my needs and my wants or my goals won't be a priority to you. So I had a chat with my first agent. Had I played in, um, and then I found another agent. Um, similar to when you're signing a national letter of intent or when you commit to a university, uh, sometimes we care about the name on the front of the jersey more than we do than the name on the back of the jersey, which is good from, from a certain standpoint. But you want to go somewhere where you can make a difference when you're going to college. Mm-hmm. And 
who, when you're an agent, who's going to work for you and don't think that you're just on their roster. Right. You know, and I've, I've heard somewhat of the same type of um, conversation or issue from a former NFLer about the agent. And this particular young man, I think he actually held a few NCAA titles, but his agent just did not, didn't work for him, didn't do anything for him. But moving back to you, um, you talked about this agent not really working on your behalf because you weren't technically the big fish. And as a woman, which is something I, as women, we are somewhat kind of climbing that ladder, um, decimating the glass ceiling, so to speak. But there still is a huge financial gap between women that are doing the same things as men, whether it's sports or in business. So like, tell me a little bit about your, just your experience with um, any financial challenges or not feeling like you were paid um, properly as a professional basketball player, because I, I do know the rules abroad are completely different. And I've heard professional basketball players talk about how they had to fight for their money. You know, once they, they've actually played, they've shown up, they, they've done what's been required of them, but they couldn't get paid. Well, I can say this. As far as uh, finances go, I, I consider myself a professional and everyone I've come across professional enough to where we value uh, uh, privacy with your financial stuff. So I don't tell people besides my agent, my mom, right. me, what my contracts were. Right. Okay. Well, um, I was doing well. If I wasn't, then, you know, no, no one knew. Um, okay. The not being paid when you're overseas. Uh, I actually did experience that, that when I played in Greece. It was during the recession when Greece kind of did, was doing really bad. Uh, you mm-hmm. know? And, you know, it sucks. And it wasn't just women. It was okay. and, and everyone. So as far as the disparity with how much you get paid is very real. Uh, you know, ticket sales and things like that. You know, you mm-hmm. get off of what you generate but when players aren't getting paid it's a dog fight and it's it's it's, there's no gender attached to it um but I I can't really speak on pay more than the next player because I worry about my grass I try to (laughs) I understand that um you mentioned that you didn't take an opportunity with the WNBA when you had it so I want to hear a little bit about that. And I want you to talk about this new pay increase that the WNBA has now with their new CBA. So talk to me about this opportunity that you didn't take. Well, um, the opportunity I didn't take, um, when I was at USF, we won, we didn't win an NCAA title, but we did win a national championship at the University of Kansas. We beat the Jayhawks. Um, and I don't know if you know, but I had my son while I was in college. So I did a fifth year. And um, I was actually on the draft boards to get drafted second round, which isn't the best, but it's not the worst. Mm-hmm. Um, foolishly, I was in love with a man who uh, asked me to stay with him overseas uh, during the summer months because the WNBA season is during the summer months mm-hmm. and is during the rest of the year. And so, you know, being in love and trying to respect my man, I said, okay, I won't enter the draft. And I advise everyone to not make that decision. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, so that's, that's how the opportunity got turned down. Uh, and I, something I do regret, but yes, ma'am. As far as the pay increase, uh, I think that it's very much deserved, well-deserved. Um, I think they should do another one. I don't I think so too. In and out um, for the collective bargaining agreement for the WNBA, but this is something that has been warranted for the past 10 to 15 years. Um, I think that female athletes that played at the WNBA, especially when Cheryl Swoops and Lisa Leslie, and mm-hmm. them, I think they should get back pay, even though they probably <laughs> right. made a lot of money. Reparations. <laughs> yeah, reparations. Um, <laughs> even though they did probably make a ton of money. Uh, based off of endorsements and things like that. Um, That's where the female athlete or the pro athlete for women, really, the hustle really is to see 
where those endorsements can come from. And that's not just for female athletes, but, you know, bring in womanhood, whether it's, you know, doesn't matter gender, sex, preference or anything, but how do we get women to really uh, be women without marginalizing themselves can help uh, really gain more endorsements, get more fans, generate sales and so on. Yeah. I agree. You know, women, we are the creator of all things. That's how I look at it. And I'm sorry, I may be a little biased because I'm a woman, but we are. I mean, we birth the people who create other things as well. Even if we are not technically creators of products or services, we have birthed the people who are providing these things to other individuals. And um, it does sadden me that sometimes we get the short end of the stick um, in different areas of life, but we are doing so much and we're making so much progress in all types of areas to, you know, have our voices heard and to support other people and to give other women a platform where their voices can be heard, where their services that they offer can be shared. Um, So that I absolutely love. And I appreciate you being here because one of your passions is to help transition athletes. Um, And you knew that there was, there was some shifts that you had to make to make your transition happen or to get where you are now. So talk to us about that passion that you have for helping athletes to transition from um, post sports to corporate America or just to their own purpose in life. Well, one thing to piggyback off um, or connect the dots with the previous two speakers is, um, you know, I think you said about it too. Uh, my freshman year of college, I had a teammate. Her name was Tristan Webb. She was a six, maybe even a seventh year senior. She had about six knee surgeries. She was around. She was the old head on the team. Um, and I found some things difficult. There was a six, seven girl there who I would bust her behind day in and day out. But since she was six, seven and all this, you know, for the first half of the season, she would get all this recognition and praise. And one day I just was in practice, just not really participating. She was like, you listen to me, young blood. You don't let anybody take away anything from you that they didn't give to you. So if your love for the game did not start here at South Florida, it shouldn't disappear here at South Florida. So that was a little off topic, but I just wanted to provide that because that's what, that's something that's helped me even until now because it's bigger than basketball, kind of like what Otis said. Mm -hmm. Um, But my passion for helping uh, student athletes stems from the lack of care or priority for our future. Um, Back in the day, the NCAA now does focus more on after the sport, which is a great thing. Um, But, you know, the lack of allowing us to work or or get a job and giving us uh, pennies to uh, live during the summer or, you know, to live during the year. You know, if you came from a two-parent household, you probably didn't get a Pell Grant because your parents made too much, right? Um, To now, you know, people can get paid for their likeness. Right. Um, Sorry if I'm going off on a tangent. Oh, no, you're fine. I love it. (laughs) When I was in school, I was always one of the ones who had all the recruits. Even when I played pro and I still lived in Tampa, PG, can you come by campus? So sometimes... uh, God, no, I'm not sure, I, if, I hope I'm not offending anyone. Sometimes God has a weird way or a funny way of showing you what you should be doing, right? So if I'm showing people for four or five years why they should come here, why they belong here, right? It's something that I'm good at. And showing people, young people, sometimes not even athletes, uh, what they're good at or labeling in their minds, what companies label as a skill or a transferable skill, that's something that I enjoy doing. If you're a captain of a team, you're a leader. Right. I can lead on the court, I can lead off the court. If I can round up 100 troops in the military, <laughs> I can monitor or make sure 100 employees are okay. Right. And sometimes uh, I help people build their resumes and stuff like that. Now they're like, I, don't, I haven't worked anywhere. I haven't done this. And it's like, no, I think you and I have had this conversation before. Yeah been doing this for 12 years. <laughs> been punctual. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> You've been doing peak performance activities um, and the list can just go on. So uh, right now I try to reach out to as many student athletes that I still have the bandwidth to keep in touch with to say, hey, you know, if you want an internship with my current company, they do seasonal this, you know, early exposure is everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You have conversations when you're getting recruited. Ask the right questions. Right. Set yourself up to stay in the driver's seat because sometimes as kids or when we were young kids, we were so, oh, I got to get a scholarship. I don't want my parents to pay for school. That's great. But guess what? You're so good. You're so talented. They need you more than you need them in a sense. Right. Understanding the value of reciprocity Mm -hmm. as an athlete is very important. Mm -hmm. Use you. Use them too. Right. Get out of it what you want to get out of it. Right. If you expect to get your master's paid for while you're still in school, hey, listen, if I finish my degree in three years, I expect to have my master's or start grad school. Right. Uh, be assertive. Be upfront. I'm sorry if I'm getting Oh, no, no, no. Look, I need school. you to I need you to keep speaking because this <laughs> is like you are you are dropping gems, of course. Um and this whole reciprocity and being in the driver's seat is so important. I've heard people say over and over again, get, stay ready so you don't have to get ready. But I think, and I'm just speaking from my own experience, coming from and being a part of the African-American brown community, um, we're, we're always taught to, hey, make sure you, know, you do what is necessary so you may get the opportunity, but we don't see it as... Um, a way for us to say and reflect on how great we are, you know, in our own right. We don't, we don't see that in us. We're just like, okay, I hope I'm doing enough so that they will notice me, but we don't even notice our own greatness. And so when you're asking for something, you also have, you know, you have something to give as well that they need. And we're all so different, Right. We're, we may not always drive together. Some company, you know, may not be a good fit, but there is something else out there that works very well with you. You may need them to move forward, but they actually may need you more than you need them. So absolutely. I absolutely love this conversation, Porsche. Um, the things that you're saying are is, is very much needed. And our children, um, our potential professional athletes, or our potential entrepreneurs and business owners, if this is the time now to start creating that business mindset. Absolutely. And, mm-hmm. and if you are if you are a student, part of your business mindset now is maybe, okay, you want to work on your resume because you want this particular internship, you have a particular passion of doing something. Well, who's out there doing the thing that I love? How do I get their attention? What is it about me that helps me to stand out? And so starting to wrap your mind around that and setting, um, you know, a certain goal steps to help you figure out where you want to be at the end of the day is so paramount to your success. And a lot of our children are not, they don't see that. They don't understand um, strategic planning. They don't understand creating and maintaining your own brand. I just had a conversation with a gentleman um, earlier this week about brand and how I pretty much realized, I'm like, oh my God, I get it now. (laughs) You know, a light bulb went off for me. But a lot of these kids are not understanding that you are your brand. What you portray and put out to people how you run your daily life, that's your brand. You are what other people, how other people perceive you, you know, and you are how you want to be perceived. That is, that is your brand. And so um, based on where you want to be, which means that you need an end game, you know, you need a plan to be in mind, you have to start with your own individualized brand, but it starts with a plan. Absolutely. Oh. I can just add really quickly, you know, when you go to college at 16, some people, 17, 18 years old, technically you're an adult, but you're still a kid. Um, You know, I think we've had this conversation before. These coaches need to be held accountable. Yeah. Because if I care enough about you as a young man or a young woman, or I look your parents in the face and say, hey, I'm going to take your baby girl or your baby boy for the next four to five years, and I'm going to make sure that they're going to be able to take care of themselves, whether it's pro 
whether it's medical school, being a doctor, whether it's running your own company. Um, I think these college coaches need to be held more accountable um, with something similar to succession planning. Mm -hmm. Typically in corporate America, if you haven't gotten anyone promoted or haven't gotten anyone or haven't leveled anyone up or haven't been good with a transfer of knowledge, Mm -hmm. I think the same rule should apply with college athletics. Um, I love it because it may not, it may not, going pro may not be that thing for that individual, but if that coach at least create the conversation, you know, with different people in different industries, that could, that could be your going pro moment, you know, as a student athlete. I agree with you. It should be a priority. They should be less selfish and more self, self, selfless. Yes. Um, And then, you know, I just wanted to make sure I added, um, it's just like pretty women and sorry, Otis, you're very handsome. (laughs) Um, Pretty women. My mom had to tell me this. You know, and one of my sisters, she said, you have to be responsible for your pretty. But when you're a student athlete, I can remember being a junior and um, someone told me I'm lucky. You know, I'll be lucky for a scholarship. And I'm like, lucky? You know, I work out 60 hours a week. I'm, I just got off of a plane this morning. I'm in class. Don't tell me I'm lucky. I bust my behind. Right. For the world as well, you know, people may like you for what you used to do and all this and that, but they want you to fail. So, the same way a pretty woman or a person of from an a ethnic background has to work twice as hard to be twice as better. The same attitude that you had when you were trying to get a college scholarship or go pro, you have to maintain that same mentality because they can't wait to see you messed up or mess mm-hmm. up or to be called a has-been. Oh, this isn't the court or this isn't the NFL. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we, have, we, we can't forget that. Uh, one other thing I wanted to add is that we have a, a, an obligation and a responsibility people who have found their niche, like you said, and people who have roadmap successfully or roadmap their career successfully to do what we're doing now. Because when I see someone who looks like me doing something I want to do, now I think that I can do it. It's believable. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that's what's helped me guide my career. You know, sometimes we have these crazy ideas, we have these big imaginations, but when you see people that look like you, that walk like you and talk like you, and have gone through the things that you've gone through, it's like, you know what? It's possible. So that's the Adidas campaign, impossible's nothing, whoop de doo But <laughs> when I see, you know, someone like Otis, um, yeah. I don't know if him or it's Lorente that works for Merrill Lynch. Hey, listen, you know, Otis, Lorente, these people, they all play in the NFL, they're financial advisors, they're business analysts, they're this. Maybe I can do it. Right. Sometimes you have that moment in your car or in your room, like, man, so what am I doing? What, who, who am I kidding here? Right. Like, you know, don't count yourself out. Right. So, yes. I, um, are student athletes or professional athletes able to contact you for help transitioning from athletics to corporate America? If so, how can you be reached? Well, um, yes. Uh, they can reach out to me. It's funny, about two weeks ago, Savania and I were having this discussion. She actually owns her own law firm. So we've been talking about ways to launch a consulting for student athletes who want to get into corporate America or who want or who want to and are brave enough to take that step to say, you know what, I'm putting the ball down and I want to, I, I want to make my life better. I want to turn the page. Yes. Uh, for now, if someone wants to reach out to me, they can uh, send me an email at Portia underscore grant at yahoo.com. Uh, anyone who's serious and wants to email me, then I can exchange further uh, information. Um, but uh, we have a legal person here who's a certified attorney past the bar. I've worked uh, in advanced management for several years. I have over 15 years of athletic experience. I've worked with HR. Uh, I haven't worked with legal yet. My mom still wants me to go to law school, so maybe, Savanya, you can help me get a discount. Um, <laughs> I, I wish I could help myself get a discount. <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to be Portia underscore Grant at Yahoo.com. P-O-R-C-H-E underscore Grant at Yahoo.com. And yes, oh. I'll be 
for anyone to reach out to me with any questions. Thanks for joining us this week on What Are You Sporting About? podcast. Make sure to visit our website, prosportlawyer.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite platform is so you'll never miss a show. And while you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes or iHeartRadio. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. If you like the show, you might want to check out our book, What Are You Sporting About? Attorney Savania DeBarros is available for private consulting at sldebarros.com. And remember, we're here to educate, support, and guide you in your journey to success because we're all sporting about something. Thank you.